Good morning, everyone. It is great to hear the laughter and the conversations in the room. We've got some announcements I want to begin with this morning. The ministry of the month this month uh, is the Retired Pastors Fund. So if you're able to remember them in your prayers and remember them with your givings, if you can, that would be greatly appreciated. The food bank needs are pasta sauce, ketchup, jam, coffee plus on Wednesday mornings. If you haven't been coming out for coffee plus, you're missing something. It is a lot of fun. It is great fellowship and uh, there's great conversations and lots going on. And um, similar to our Coffee Plus, um, Wilmot has invited us to join them in a um, games night in the day, is what they're calling it. Um, some of us don't love to drive in the evening, so they're going to have a Saturday afternoon uh, fellowship at the Wilmot Christian Fellowship Center. There's a poster on the bulletin board at the back if you're uh, interested in that with more details, and I would encourage you to attend. There's a few folks from Wilmot that are coming here on the Wednesday Coffee Plus, and it certainly is adding to our fellowship and fun, so it would be nice to reciprocate and uh, show up uh, for theirs as well. For the month of November, uh, we have an opportunity to help children in Rwanda. This year we're giving towards school and we're partnering with Canadian Baptist Ministries in something called Hopeful Gifts for Change. This is reduce a barrier, open a door. And if you look over on the wall, you'll see that we have a number of doors strung out, ready to be open. You also see that there are two doors that are open and happy children uh, behind those doors as pictured. And uh, so as we gather the resources to open a door, it will reflect on the wall, so you'll see how we're doing. So right now, we've brought in somewhere over $140 because it's $70 each to open a door. And so as we contribute to this, we'll see more doors open. So I really invite you to um, partner with that um, as well this month and certainly remember it in your prayers also. A few things. Uh, on Tuesday evening this week, we are going to have a Bible study. Tuesday evening, we're going to have a Bible study. It's going to be here at the CFC, and it's going to be online. So if you're able to come to the CFC, we'll be gathering and, and having a Bible study. If you are unable to but wish to join online, I will send out a Zoom link in my email to the church family tonight. And part of this study will also be a time of prayer similar to what we had in our prayer nights, only a bit of an abridged version of that. So it'll be a prayer night and a Bible study. It will begin at 7 p.m. on Tuesday evening, and it will run until 8.30 or so. I say or so because sometimes the conversations don't end at a, at a time. So... On Sunday, November 20th, next week, we have Randy Stanton uh, coming to join us once again. He was here last week, or last week, last year, to speak about hopeful gifts of change, and uh, he's uh, willing to come back and, and uh, be with us once again. So next week, we'll have a guest uh, presenter, and it will be Randy, and so we look forward to seeing him. And then also next week on the 20th, there will be a church meeting following worship, to consider the reception of a new member by way of transfer. Uh, Misty has indicated that she would like to transfer her membership to this church. And the process is somebody asks to have that happen and then we vote upon it and then we send, if, if we're in agreement, we send a request to that church for a letter. So we need to vote next week on that. So we'll do that right after the service. And then... On Sunday, November 27th, mark this in your calendars, we're going to have a music night. And we are going to do our music night in the evening. It will be Sunday evening, beginning at 7 p.m., and it will run until 8.30-ish. See what I did there, huh? Um, it'll run until 8.30 or so. 
And, um, but it is going to be a night of hymns where you will get to sing. It will be a night of praise songs where you get to sing and listen. It will be a night of special presentations uh, from people who have been uh, kind enough to uh, say they're going to share some music with us that night. So it will be uh, many things uh, on that evening. So Wednesday evening, November 30th, there'll be a musical presentation by the Choral Society, Middleton Choral Society, and that will be happening at the Anglican Church. And you do have to ask for tickets for that, no? You can just pay at the door. So you, you can just pay at the door. And that is also uh, on the bulletin board at the back as well. Now, a couple of things I want to share with you. Um, last month, uh, the 12 Baskets Food Bank, we did the gathering of things for the food bank. And uh, just again, uh, we had it in the bulletin last month, but I just want to make note of it again because it is quite remarkable. As well as giving 600 and some odd pounds of food, this church also gave $541. And um, it's, that's outstanding. And uh, I just praise God for the way that... Um, this church gives, and I, I just want to offer that as an encouragement. And uh, we all give a little, and it, it adds up. Um, Daily Bread Ministries last month, we gave an additional $446 to Daily Bread as well. So good work, gang. Um, praise God for that. And um, I just pray that his blessing will be upon those ministries that we have chosen to support uh, this year. And now I feel like it's time to really get down to the business of praising and worshiping God, Connie. Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship today is Psalm 63, verses 1 to 5. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. I have seen you in your sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than, my, better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the riches of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together today to praise you through song, prayer, and fellowship. We want to thank you for your many blessings you have bestowed on us. You are our wonderful shepherd. Be with Pastor Jeff as he shares what you have placed on his heart. And let us have ears to hear and be open to your guiding. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we sing hymn number nine, Glorify Thy Name.
You may be seated. I want to invite the praise team to join on stage now, if you can. Like this. 
God, we sing our praise to you, and we pray, God, for your blessing to be upon us, but we pray, Lord, that we also bless your name with the way we live our lives, with the way we worship you. We ask, God, for you to be guiding us today. May the words we sing and the words we hear and speak, may they resonate, God, with your truth. Bless us today as we join together our hearts in praise and in seeking of your presence, God. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Our responsive reading is titled, Praise His Name. Lord, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. Lord, we will proclaim your name for all our days. Amen. Let's pray for our offering and for the hopeful gifts. Let's pray. Father, we freely give you our offerings today. Bless them and help us to use them to do your works and glorify you. We also ask for your blessings on our Hopeful Gifts project. As we, finan as we give financially, let us be mindful of the children we hope to help. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Con. in the singing of Come Thou Found. Lord God, Heavenly Father, to whom we sing our adoration and our praise, 
we ask that you will prepare us through the presence of your Holy Spirit. Prepare us so that we may come before you, stand before you worthy, and that we seek you properly today, God. Cleanse our hearts, Lord. May all who worship this day present ourselves, our bodies, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, God. Shed your light on us so that our human understanding is full. Cleanse our desires and our motives, God, so that we may be seeking you earnestly in a true desire to know you. Lord, stir in us obedience to your word and open us up, God, to Holy Spirit's leading. Lord, we lift to you today those around us who have gone through a time of suffering. We think of the families who have lost loved ones, the families who have loved ones who are battling for their lives, God, the families who have loved ones who are aging and facing struggles, can no longer be at home and need to find a better, more suitable place to be. Lord God, there's so many of these folks around us who are transitioning in, in their lives and there's so little place to transition to. So Lord God, we lift them to you. We pray, God, for you to be giving them peace and reassurance. We pray, God, for those people who work in these special care places that you may bless them and give them an abundance of grace that they may share with others, an abundance of love that they may pass on to those whom they look after, God. We lift them to you. We thank you, God, for their willingness to take on these roles. But we know, God, it is challenging. So we ask that you strengthen them. Lord, as we come together as a church, seeking you in this time, we want to pray your blessing upon us as we seek to not just bless this community and this place where we live and find ourselves, but we also think about those folks across the world, God, who need your love and can benefit from the help that we can give. Lord God, we think of those children in Rwanda those little ones, God, who have a hunger to learn. God, may our gifts toward hopeful gifts, may it give them what they need, God, to learn, and may that open doors, God, to learning about you. May their thirst for knowledge, God, lead them toward you. May you bless them richly, God. And may you multiply what we give so that it may reach even further in a way that only you can do, God. And Lord, as we look to your word today, direct us so that your name will be exalted, that your words will be heard and understood. May we glorify you today, God, for all that you are, you are gentle yet powerful. You are lowly, yet you are almighty. You are a shepherd, and yet you are a king. Lord, in your gentleness, guide us. In your power, strengthen us. In your lowliness, stir us from our selfish pride and lead us humbly toward you. Lord God, we give of this time, seeking you, praying your blessing be upon this flock, that we may be loyal subjects of your mighty kingdom, fully submission to your lordship, in full submission to your lordship, God. Bless us today. This we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So Janet's not the only one that's been thinking about Christmas already. I'm not a, I'm not a decorator when it comes to Christmas stuff. I'm, uh, I, I 
I lean a little differently that way, but, but I do think about Christmas early in the, in the year. And usually in church, we don't start Christmas stuff until Advent. But this year, I wanted to do a pre-Advent focus, and it's going to take us in a direction of Christmas. What I realized is that I get to talk about the birth passages of Jesus but once a year, really, and earnestly. But in those passages are these great bits of prophecy that I never really get to touch on. So this year I want to start the, the spiritual journey toward Christmas by looking at a passage that is referred to every year but that I've really never spoken about at length. It is a passage of prophecy pointed to in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, where the angel comes to Joseph and speaks to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived is her, in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Matthew adds this. He says this all took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, when I read that in Matthew, I move on and I talk about the Christmas story. But today, I want to take a look at that bit of prophecy in Isaiah. The prophecy about the young girl having a son and naming him Isaiah. Naming him Isaiah, no. Naming him Emmanuel. This is found in Isaiah chapter 7. So if you got your Bibles today, we're going to Isaiah chapter 7. Now, a little bit about this. Isaiah was a prophet about 700 years before this proclamation was made to Joseph. So this is a 700-year jump back in time that we're going to make. And at that time, there were two kingdoms. The kingdom had been divided, and there was a north and a south kingdom of the 12 tribes. And the, the northern kingdom um, was struggling more than the southern kingdom. They had a series, both kingdoms had a series of not so great kings. The northern kingdom is called Israel, which can be confusing. The southern kingdom is called Judah. But that northern kingdom also has some other names that it's referred to in the Bible, and we're going to encounter one of those today. Now, Isaiah lived in this southern kingdom, and he was called to the role of prophet during the reign of a king by the name of Uzziah. Now, Uzziah was, as kings go in, in the lineage of kings, he was not so bad, but not so great. He didn't live up to all God had placed upon him and expected of him. But he was a king who reigned a long time, and he was a king who had a reign of relative peace in the nation. So he's remembered well. Now, chapter 7 of Isaiah comes about 20 years after the time of Uzziah. And it's at the time of his grandson's reign a fellow by the name of Ahaz. Now, things are much less peaceful at this time, and Ahaz is not nearly the man that his grandfather was. The problem that the southern kingdom is facing this time, or one of the problems that they're facing, is that there's a coalition of nations who want to rise up against the powerful nation of Assyria that's kind of lurking around them all the time. And this coalition of nations is the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria or Aram. So in our passage today, or if you're looking at Isaiah chapter 7, you're going to see Ephraim as named and Aram. Well, Ephraim is that northern kingdom. Aram is the Syrian kingdom. 
they have come together and they want to rise up against Assyria because they see them as a threat. And they want the southern kingdom of Judah to join them in this uprising. And this started many years ago. During the time of Uzziah, there was, there was talk of this, and Uzziah had declined this, and his son had declined it, and now Ahaz is, is king, and he's being urged to join this coalition, and he won't. So now they're coming, and they've actually made an attack on the southern kingdom of Judah. And they nearly took Jerusalem, but they didn't. But the thing is, is that they nearly took Jerusalem. So as Ahaz begins his reign, this northern kingdom and Syria make this military advance. They're nearly successful. And it shakes the nation and it shakes the king to the core. These guys are fearful of what's going to happen to them. They just don't know what's going on. There's turmoil. There's uncertainty. So the king begins to prepare for war. But he's doing so deeply impacted by what just happened. He's not confident in the abilities of his nation to withstand the attack that they're going to face. He is shaken to his core. Now this is the background to chapter 7. So there's very real threats of war. The nation is shaken And God calls Isaiah to give a message of reassurance and a very rare opportunity for validation of that message. God sends Isaiah and one of his sons, who, by the way, Isaiah has two sons and they're both given prophetic names. The son that God sends with Isaiah that day has a name that translates to a remnant shall return. So, God is already preparing them for something not so great is going to happen in the naming of this this child. But Isaiah and, and his son go and meet the king at the upper pool. Now, at that time, the the water supply for the nation was above ground and it was vulnerable. So the king was probably at the upper pool preparing for a pending attack. Now, the pool was also a very public place. So there would be people around to witness this this conversation. So at the pool, Ahaz, the king, meets with Isaiah and the boy. And God speaks through Isaiah to give him a message. And the message is, keep calm and be careful. Don't be afraid of these enemies God shares. He says that, These nations are ruled by men who are not even really worthy of being mentioned by name. When God talks about them through Isaiah, he mentions them as sons of their fathers, which is kind of a sign of they're not even respected enough to be called by their their given names. They're shadows of their fathers. God tells the king that these guys are smoldering stumps. A lot of smoke but no fire. You don't need to be afraid of them. God tells them that all their plotting and their threats will come to nothing as long as Ahaz stands firm in his faith. This is great, right? The king is shaken to his core. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what's going on. And God is saying, listen, all you have to do is nothing. Just do nothing and trust me. Do nothing and trust me. Do that and it'll all be good. But God also says, if you don't stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And that's where our passage is going to begin today. This is verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 7. The Lord sent this message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want, as high as heaven, or as deep as the place of the dead. But the king refused. No, he said, I will not test the Lord like that. Then Isaiah said, listen well. 
you, royal family of David. Isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and she will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he will be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the lands of both kings you fear so much will be deserted. May God bless this reading of his word. So what's happened here is in the face of God coming to the king and saying, all you got to do is trust me, do nothing else. The king is not yet there. And the, then God gives him this really rare opportunity for a sign. Ask for anything. Make it as high as heaven or as deep as Sheol. Ask for anything. I'll give you the confirmation that you need. This is a rare opportunity. And the king says, I will not test God. Now, now, we do have passages that tell us not to put God to the test. But in this situation, the king is not really as reverent as he may seem. It's a bit of false piety here because history shows that Ahab, Ahaz had little reverence for Yahweh. His turning down this opportunity isn't trusting, sorry, this opportunity is trusting on his own wisdom. In 2 Kings, we get to look at a little bit of, of how Ahaz was. Chapter 28 says that he plundered the temple and the kingdom in order to pay a tribute to Assyria. So instead of taking this golden opportunity that God gives him for confirmation. God says, listen, do nothing. Trust me, I got this. I'll even give you a sign. Ahaz instead goes and plunders the temple, plunders the nation, takes what he can gather up and gives it to Assyria for protection. Basically, he's He's admitting defeat to Assyria before they've even gone to war. He wants them to protect him against these two nations that God has told them are smoldering stumps. They're, they're smoke, but no fire. This is why Isaiah announces the prophecy. You wouldn't accept the sign that God was willing to give you. Now, God is going to give you a sign whether you want it or not. That's what's happening here. Isaiah says, look, the virgin. This isn't, this isn't just announcing that there'll be some girl somewhere who's going to give birth to a child and name him Emmanuel. The way this reads, and in my looking at it, they're probably in the presence of a young girl. Isaiah's probably pointing to her and saying, this girl is going to give birth to a son, and he's going to be named Emmanuel, which means God with us, a reminder to you, king, of you turning down these opportunities and not trusting God in the way he's called you to trust. She's going to name him God with us, and before that child is old enough to eat solid foods, those two nations that you're so afraid of, There'll be nothing. That is the prophecy that is given that we refer back to from Matthew. What this points to is a very troubling time in the nation of Judah. A very troubling time in the lineage of the kings who are ancestors of David. It's only a number of years after this when Assyria really takes over and puts this nation to an end as well. The people are taken captive. There's a remnant that remains, just like the boy's name proves. 
So why does this matter in the coming of the Messiah? In Matthew, we have Joseph. Joseph, who is a descendant of King David. God has chosen Joseph and his betrothed Mary, who has pleased God, to bring forth his son, Emmanuel, God with us. And that child will be our Savior. Matthew is told that he will name him Jesus. It says, She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. By naming him Jesus, Joseph is basically bringing that child, even though not born of him, into his family. This is an adoption, and this is official. This is making Jesus, even though he is God with us, God's one and only Son, it is making him a descendant of this kingly line of David. And this passage ties us back to that. And God connects the dots for us. The sins of the people who brought forth that first sign, that first look, this virgin's going to give birth to a child. The sin the not trusting God, the not doing as God has instructed, has brought forth this new Son, this God with us in Jesus Christ. So the first time we hear that, that prophecy is a judgment. And the second time we hear it, that prophecy is salvation. What a beautiful picture. A picture of of God's patience and God's love. A picture of how God desires us to trust Him, to listen to what He's asking of us, and sometimes do nothing but trust Him. Nothing else. Don't make a move. Just trust me. I got this. That's what He was asking Ahab. If you just do nothing, I will prove, I will prove how much I love this nation. If you just do nothing. And Ahaz didn't have it in him to do that. So now we're preparing ourselves for Christmas. We're making our homes beautiful. We're planning our our meals and our activities. And I want to say... I mean no disrespect when I say this, but if we did nothing but trust God, it would be a pleasing celebration of Christmas. If we did nothing but turn our hearts toward Him, it would be a pleasing celebration of Christmas. We can drive ourselves crazy with all the the buzz and the, the getting of things and the doing of things, We can drive ourselves crazy. And what God really wants, He wants our attention. He wants us to trust in Him and live lives that that prove who He is and how much He loves us. If we did nothing but that, it would be a wonderful celebration of Christmas. Now that all this other stuff that we can do, that it's fantastic as long as we do it with the right heart. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you the world is, is turning Christmas on its ear and Christmas is not what it needs to be for many of us. Christmas is, is about buying things and doing things. And does the, the world need to buy a whole bunch of stuff that's probably made under questionable labor practices in places that turn a blind eye toward The environment? Probably not. How much of that stuff that we buy in in this season is going to end up buried in a hole somewhere in the next five years? A lot of it. We are 
we are focusing on the wrong things when we focus on things. If we just, just do nothing but trust Him, it would be a great celebration of Christmas. Now, I'm not saying that all that we do is bad. But I'm saying, think about what we do. You could lighten your load some and just trust Him and it would be a good celebration of Christmas. So may God lead us in that way. May God use the scriptures to open our eyes to how he loves us and how we can live our lives more peacefully and more simply in praise and love of him. May we be a church that proclaims him king with word and deed, but may we be courageous enough to stand still at times and do nothing but trust him. Amen. So the praise team are going to come up and join me for one final song.
God, we just pray your blessing upon us today. We ask, God, that you give us Jesus, that you give us the peace that he brings, the power that you have for us, God, the ability to trust and to live, God, lives glorifying to you, especially at this time of year. Lord, we ask that you bless our time together as we continue in fellowship and the food we're about to share, God. May you bless our conversations and the food to our body's use, Lord. We ask that you be with us today. In Christ Jesus' holy and powerful name, remembering that he is God with us. Amen. Amen. So may the God of all grace give you all that he has for you. He has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, our Emmanuel. So may he restore you and establish and strengthen us. Amen.